This is Pat Prescott from the Waves Morning Show. I have a very special guest today. He is a human rights activist, and he's the eldest son of Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, the perfect person to talk to today about his father's legacy and, and also about how it relates to events in America's recent past. We welcome Martin Luther King III. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate having they me. Call you, they call you Trey or they... Or anything no. like that. <laughs> well, I've, I've, interestingly enough, I've never been called that. Just this Martin. <laughs> <laughs> and but boy, uh, there are some, every now and then somebody will say that. I'll hear it from time. Uh -huh. Well, it's a great name to have, and uh, with it comes uh, a lot of uh, kind of responsibility, you know. And you followed in your dad's footsteps in so many ways. You named after him, mm -hmm. you know. Same college, Morehouse. Same frat, FIA. Uh, you've done a lot of the same things he, he's done. You know, you've been an advocate for social justice. You've been arrested. You even took on the 50th anniversary of that trip that your parents made to India. You did that as well. Uh, what does it mean to you to uphold that legacy, difficult as it may be sometimes? So really what it, it, it is to me is um, it, it's a legacy of, of love and my mother and father, you know, instilled in me as a child uh, to love yourself, to love your family, to have a love of your community and to have a love of God. And my, I find my wife and I are, are imparting that same kind of vision uh, upon our, our daughter, Yolanda Renee. Um, and, uh, you know, at 12 years old, um, she has already demonstrated uh, an affinity for leadership, not because we push her because, you know, we just as my, I'm, I'm grateful because my mother never said to me, Martin, you know, you have to go to Morehouse or Martin, you need to, you should be a minister or Martin, you should be a civil rights activist. She basically said, Martin, you be your best self and we will support you in whatever way that we need to. We want to, you just want you to be your best self. And that was, uh, gave me a remarkable amount of, of freedom uh, so that I could choose. I, I haven't been called to the ministry in my judgment, but I certainly did go to Morehouse. I certainly have been involved in civil and human rights. I was the fourth president of the organization Dad co-founded, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, I founded an organization called Realizing the Dream. I've been a president of the Martin Luther King Center. So, um, And now the organization that my father actually founded he and a lawyer back in 1961, the Drum Major Institute. I'm the chairman of the board of the Drum Major Institute. So I'm still uh, continuing that work uh, to create, um, uh, I would say, peace, equity, and, and, and justice in our nation and, and the world. Um, but getting specifically back to the, to the question, the legacy is larger than life. And... I try not to look at it as filling shoes of my dad. I'd feel miserable. I have to do what Martin III feels his mission is. And as I said, I'm thankful that my mom allowed me to do that. And, um, but I do understand that dad wanted to eradicate poverty, racism, and militarism from our society. And he did not get to... Uh, get anywhere near completing his mission. So as a result, uh, I have felt compelled to work to figure out how do we eradicate these triple evils? What can we do in a nation with so much abundance, even with a very terrible economy, in a nation with so much opportunity, so much ingenuity, um, so much talent? We see talent emerging every day. Just yesterday at the uh, inauguration, we saw the young sister as a poet uh, so profoundly. Angelou. You know, we, we think about Maya Angelou, who there was only one Maya Angelou, but this, this sister is going to be some, is, is somebody. Um, and my only point is there's talent like that all over our community uh, that needs to be known about, uh, that, that is transformative, um, that is, is just amazing. So, 
you know, I'm, I guess I'm, you didn't ask me this, but I'm, I'm excited about the prospect of where we uh, can go as a nation, because I think President uh, Biden, along with Vice President Harris, have restored, it should have restored many people's faith uh, initially in government. I say initially because there's a lot of work to do, but the president set the right tone by what he said yesterday in his remarks about us being a united uh, nation, nation, nation and about being a nation that is going to abolish racism um, and, and many other things. And so I, I feel very excited about the prospect, although the work now really begins. Yeah, there's, there is promise in the air. I would imagine that this is this time of year is very emotional for you as well, because uh, we do celebrate the legacy of your dad. We have Black History Month coming right after that. And then in April, of course, the anniversary of his loss. And I know you were just 10 years old at that time. I remember um, I was in high school. I, I believe I was 16 then. Mm -hmm. And it was just so devastating. And even now today, after all this time, you know, when you relive the events of, of that, that period, um, I'm sure it's got to be it's got to be tough for you emotionally. How, how does it feel to you this time of year? And along with the rest of your life, of course, losing your dad at such a young age. Well, you know, interestingly enough, um, the holiday itself, um, we have always defined it as a day on, not a day off. Uh, a holiday traditionally means you kick back and chill. But this is a day where you recommit yourself. Uh, and your community to fulfilling the work uh, that, um, you know, still has to be done. So I, I always ask the question, well, did we achieve or fulfill the dream last year? And the answer always is no. Uh, what is amazing about the fact that dad was born in January is it gives us an opportunity to start anew. And so every year we can start it's almost like your New Year's resolutions. Um, but one day we will achieve the dream of freedom and justice and equality for all humankind. And so um, I am always um, very positive and upbeat, uh, certainly in January. Uh, when we get to African American History Month, I'm always wondering what, when are we gonna get to the day where we truly acknowledge the contributions that African Americans have made to our nation and world uh, in, in, a, in, in a way that everyone appreciates. And, and that, that's why we have African American History Month, so that we can uh, learn. Because unfortunately, our history is Western, taught Western and European, which excludes Native people, which excludes Latino and Hispanics, which includes Black folk, uh, which includes so many Asian Americans. Uh, so we have to have a period called Black History Month where we focus on. Now, go, I'll, ideally, the goal is to be studying the history of all of the people of our nation uh, all year long. So that when you open your history books in September or August, you're studying uh, about our history and European history and native history. And when you close your history books, uh, when school is over for the summer, you're still studying all of the different ethnic groups. That ideally is where we need to go, but we've got a long way to get there. Then, of course, by the time we get um, to April, which is the month dad was killed, um, I, that's always a somewhat tough period because it brings up a lot of memories. Um, you know, certainly death is, is sort of can be final. But the irony of it for me is because there are so many anniversaries throughout the year, it's almost like dad is frozen in time. And so it really is not so much negative. I don't really focus on the negative. I always try to focus on the positive and, and lifting up, uh, even, even during the time of his death. I mean, I've talked about it so long now uh, for all of these 50 plus years uh, that it has been, 53 now, uh, that, um, while I could stop and get emotional, I think about, you know, the, still the work that we've, we've got to do, the doors that we've got to open, the opportunities that we need to create uh, for 
uh, so many in our nation. The fact that, you know, dad was working on the poor people's campaign and, and um, you know, thankful for the leadership of Reverend William Barber uh, because he has been working relentlessly uh, to lift up the quality of life uh, for the poor in this nation, which really is over 130 million. They tell you 40 million, that that's what their statistics say, but those statistics are not true. Uh, what Reverend Barber and others have documented as these millions of people that are working and just not making enough to make ends meet. And that number excels, as I said, to about 130 million people. And so thank God that people like Reverend Barber, dad was focused in 1967 for 1968, the Poor People's Campaign to bring poor blacks, whites, uh, Native Americans, Americans from all walks of life to Washington to say to policymakers that we demand the right to decent jobs with decent pay. We demand a living wage. In fact, that's the reason really he was killed because he was talking about a radical redistribution of wealth. He wasn't killed because he was talking about folk sitting in, in the front of a restaurant or in a movie theater or, or being able to buy something downtown. When you start talking about redistributing distribution of wealth and resources, that was frightening to those in power. And because he was able to mobilize blacks and whites and Latinos and, and Asians and, 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 and all of that was very frightening to them. And that's when they said this force has to go. You know, uh, let's talk a little bit about Georgia. So super exciting. And I know that your dad would be excited about that too. The role of Georgia in the, the presidential election, the congressional elections, um, uh, Raphael Warnock and, and John Ossoff, Stacey Abrams, all Georgia is the place to be right now. Well, uh, you know, let's, let, let's hope so. And it, it, what I would say is we in Georgia are extraordinarily excited. We were excited uh, in November when Georgia became uh, a democratic um, when, when Georgia actually uh, voted for the first time in 30 years for a Democrat, and that is, uh, at that time, it was President-elect Biden and Vice President Harris. We were excited on January 5th when Georgia elected its first Black United States Senator, Pastor Ebenezer, the church my father uh, co-pastored many years ago uh, in Dr. Warnock, and its first Jewish senator, John Ossoff, giving the Democratic uh, apparatus a majority uh, in the United States Senate. Um, and so we in Georgia, we are very excited. And let me say this, it was a coalition of blacks and whites and, and Jews and uh, Latinos and, and, and Asians and young and old. And much of the credit certainly has to be given to the, the, from the nuclear standpoint to a black woman, Stacey Abrams. Uh, but there were many black women who had a number of organizations that helped bring the vote out. Um, and so it was not just one organization and one individual, it was many. And they all worked in, in harmony, over 20 organizations. In fact, I was involved with an organization called Win Both Seats that Andrew Yang started. And there were a number of us and we raised over $3 million that went to all these organizations on the ground that helped to bring the vote out, that helped to, your registration with education creates participation. And that's what the uh, grassroots organizations, the People's Coalition of Georgia, the, the new um, Georgia Coalition, um, uh, the Black Voters Matter, uh, Latasha Brown, and, and the list goes on and on of people who work diligently. Now, my view is that same kind of apparatus can be duplicated and we won in Georgia and we're so grateful for that, but it also can happen in North Carolina. It also can happen in, um, I believe in, um, in South Carolina and in Mississippi. That same kind of apparatus can be created so that, that we can help bring the vote out and you know the margin of victory or difference can, can occur. So th this is a very exciting time. This is, we, we're charting new ground, I would say. Yeah, and, and Georgia has created a blueprint, as you just alluded to, that uh, I think a lot of people can use it. And it harkens back, really, uh, to the civil rights movement that your dad started in the 60s. The organization of that was such an important piece. 
you know, that whole on the ground campaign that was put together, people working together and figuring this whole thing out. You mentioned Andrew Yang, and I know you as the, the first person in your family to really be involved in politics in the way that you have, uh, have come out now and endorsed uh, Andrew Yang. Talk about that a little bit and what you think it would mean for him to become the next mayor of New York. So first of all, let me say, I, I, I've been, well, I worked with Andrew, um, not during his campaign, but I was intrigued by his concept of a basic uh, annual income, a basic guaranteed income that he said he uh, got the concept really from my father because dad was talking about that back in 1967. Um, so um, I watched him and then we began to work together here in Georgia. Uh, we campaigned together. We knocked on doors. We did some media opportunities. And then, of course, we raised money. Uh, for the on the ground organizations. And he told me, you know, he felt he was called to run for office in New York and that he was going to focus on uh, making sure that the income existed, but primarily addressing poor folk. Um, I never heard a politician talk about poor uh, eradicating uh, poverty. And, you know, he had a, he has a plan that can work and reduce poverty. And he wants to make New York a world-class example that other cities can follow. And so he asked me to be a co-chair and I thought about it for um, a bit. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that because I like what he is saying, um, and I know that there are a lot of young people from around the country that are going to be supporting him, uh, I certainly decided I would throw my support behind him as one of his co-chairs. And uh, although there are probably, I don't know, 20 candidates running, uh, I think that his vision will catch on. And I think that he's going to be a formidable candidate uh, and, and perhaps will become the next mayor of New York City. You know, before we had a chance to even celebrate the victories of uh, Warnock and Ossoff in Georgia, we saw carnage at the Capitol, uh, unlike anything that we've ever seen in the history of this country. Um, looking at that whole thing and thinking about your dad's legacy, how relevant is nonviolence today when we see so much violence around us everywhere? Well, quite frankly, I think that that makes nonviolence even more relevant uh, because, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you hope that cooler heads prevail. But the whole philosophy or an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which was, you know, Old Testament, uh, if we embrace that philosophy, most of us would be without eyes or teeth. So obviously we've got to move to a higher level. And as God's highest creation, humankind, we can, re we can respond in a more civil and, and, and sane and responsible way. Um, so I, I think the philosophy of nonviolence is, is always a responsible way to bring about change. Um, now, you know, what one of the things that dad and his team did was they used the technique of boycotting. Think about Montgomery, 381 days, people didn't ride the buses of Montgomery. That was a nonviolent demonstration. No one was hurt. Uh, the only person who was hurt actually was the Montgomery bus uh, department or 60% uh, of their ridership was black folk. And when 60% don't ride for 381 days, you have a serious deficit. Uh, but what that caused the power structure to do was to do the right thing. They may not have been doing the right thing for the right thing's sake because they truly wanted integration, but they had no choice because their backs were being broken by an economic withdrawal. That's something we might need to look at as a community, quite frankly, today. Uh, exercising our buying power. We are, uh, we spent a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars last year. Um, and uh, we're constantly making the margin of profit for many of these corporations. Uh, and some, maybe we need to think about withdrawing for a minute um, and, and, and really doing a uh, support of our own banks and institutions, our own insurance companies. Not, we're not talking about segregation, but this is what other communities do. The Italians do it, the French do it, 
you know, even the Nigerian brothers and sisters here and the Haitian brothers, they support each other. But the black community in general, we just support any and everybody and don't have a commitment to ourselves. And so we, I think that's something we need to think about. I think that nonviolence is, is applicable today. Uh, in, in, and I, I do believe that we can constructively address. I think that if we, tr I mean, you know, we could, I don't even want to put that out in the universe, but there are those, I will say, who want to see a civil war. Um, and that would be downright deadly and destructive because so many people have guns on all sides. We have gunned up, we are more gunned up than we've ever been in the history of our planet. And to me that, I don't like to embrace fear, but that's certainly very frightening to know that civil society, that we as God's highest creation are devolving to a, the lowest level of resolving our conflict. You, you know, when you think about it, you know, you've never seen, you know, dogs um, do anything but, but, but argue and fight. You've never seen cats or lions. They, they fight and it's survival of the fittest. But God's highest creation, man, Man has the capacity and human, I should just not say man, I'm, human beings <laughs> have the capacity to reason and to think. And yet when we get ready to resolve conflict, we resort to lower animal means. You've never seen a, a group of dogs talking about Plato and Socrates, Euripides, W.E.B. Du Bois, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth. They don't have that capacity. You've never seen a, a group of lions, <laughs> you know, talking about I'm Christian, I'm Muslim, I'm Jewish, I'm Hindu, I'm Buddhist, I'm atheist, I'm agnostic. They don't have that ability. You've never seen a group of cats talking about I'm Democrat or Republican, I'm independent. They don't have that ability. But we as humankind, God's cre highest creation have the capacity to go to a higher level, and yet we reduce to the lowest level. That must change. Nonviolence teaches us how to coexist without destroying person or property. It teaches us dignity and respect. And that's where we have to start, teaching each, treat, treating each other with dignity and respect um, and creating a, a civil dialogue. Yeah. You've done a, a lot to to preserve your father's legacy, too, in terms of of uh, his image, the use of his words uh, and, and all of that as well. I just recently saw uh, the new film MLK FBI and, and had a co great conversation with Sam Pollard, who was the director of that film. And we talked about the fact that in 2027, those uh, FBI tapes are going to be released and that a lot of people will be looking at the prurient side of it. But he talked about how important those could be to the legacy because of all the other things that were on those tapes, because the preponderance of it, the most of it has got to be the conversations that he was having with Andrew Young and all the other leaders who were part of that. How much do you know about, um, about that material and what are your hopes for what we find when it's released? Well, you know, I honestly do not know um, a lot. What I will say is we generally knew, even I was a child, so I can't say I knew, but uh, it was generally known that the FBI was, uh, was always around. Um, Harassing. <laughs> and it wasn't a secret. So... Um, my bigger question, and I'm unfortunate, I mean, I'm biased, so I, I can't, um, I don't know if I have the capacity, I will try to be as objective as possible, but I am aware that the FBI, for example, hired actors to engage in sex scenes. So where does the truth meet the lie? You know, um, it would be perplexing to me. My grandfather told my father in 1961, son, because he was very close to the chief of police in Atlanta. And the chief of policeman uh, of Atlanta told my grandfather, you need to tell your son that everything he's doing is being monitored. So it doesn't make sense to me that you would say there are these uh, you know, illicit kind of affairs that are going on that he knew he was being monitored. It's just not logical, but that's just one aspect of you know, all of what perhaps will come out uh, or what can come out. Um, I'm, I'm raising that only because in my mind, I'm trying to logically figure out if, if you don't know something, that's one thing. But when you know something, 
then it meant no longer makes sense. So you have sense enough to organize nonviolent movement uh, to uh, and 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 strategic kinds of things that will change the world, but then you don't have sense enough. It just doesn't make sense. I, yeah, it doesn't it's make just sense. Things that go through my mind. So my higher point is this: uh, perhaps there will be something that comes out that really talks about the profoundness of a lot of the discussions that existed. Uh, and that you know, perhaps would be the, the hope. Um, the reality is back then, everything that was done was illegal by what the government was done, uh, was doing, excuse me, what Hoover was doing, uh, you know, what the uh, Justice Department was doing uh, was totally illegal. And if a court action had been taken, the government would have been found culpable. And uh, today, of course, after the Patriot Act, you know, everything, there are whole new rules. And there are no rules today. They can do anything. I mean, there are no freedoms. Freedoms, I shouldn't say there are no freedoms, but our freedoms are limited today compared to what they were supposed to be back then. And when they were the own government, the government was breaking its own rules back then. Yeah, there's no privacy is what it is. And there's, no. you know, this is the best time in the history of, of mankind to just be on the up and up at all times, <laughs> because mm -hmm. we're definitely being observed, you know. Uh, I wanted the last thing I wanted to talk about just a little bit was, uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on your dad and about um, um, men in this movement. But I know in your life, uh, three women in particular, and I would imagine your wife as well, have been really powerful, your mom, of course, your amazing sister, Yolanda, who I had the, the honor and privilege to know and to, to speak to back when I worked on the radio in New York, and also the new Yolanda, little Yolanda, the young one. Talk about the women in your life and how important women are to the movement. You know, I'm glad you're raising that because uh, quite frankly, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., um, it, it was, it's very interesting. He said that my mom, um, when they first met, mother was already involved in peace demonstrations. He had not been involved yet. Now he had read, they read a lot of the same books. That's what created this, the synergy and, and the, you know, they spent hours together just conversing when they first met and she had never met anyone who had read as much as he had. And he had never met anyone who had been in, who had read a lot of the same books and also had been engaged by going to peace demonstrations. So my, my point is their relationship throughout their lives was one where dad really lifted her up. He appreciated and lifted his wife up uh, and she represented him on many occasions. She used to do freedom concerts and sing, um, you know, around the nation, raising money for SCLC. Um, Dad would often call her uh, when he was on the road to solicit her advice and counsel on things, particularly important things that he was doing. And, um, you know, I, I remember Ambassador Young sharing that oftentimes they'd be on the road and dad would be under the cover and he would be talking to mom, you know, about, you know, not, not just, not personal. This was not, you know, just the romantic, that part existed, but this was about, you know, what should I do? What do you think I ought to do? These are the options. And what is your, what are your thoughts? And oftentimes he would take that advice and, and embrace it and use it. So my, my point is, when you think about that dad had um, uh, over a million document paper, well, not a million, but a number of documents. And half of those documents he gave to Boston University. The other half, he mom had the vision to hold on to them so that when the King Center was created, she would have a basis for an archives. And that ended up being over a million documents that she collected. But, you know, she, she thought about a lot of things. I mean, when you're in the middle of movement, you know, dad wrote six books, you know, he led the organization. He, um, you know, he was involved in, in jail and all kinds of things. And yet mom was the foundation 
because she understood that what you're doing is creating a body of history and she preserved and protected all of that information. So that when you think about it, dad was killed April 4th, 1968. By June of 1968, a Martin Luther King Center was started. To start an institution, it you know, it could take you five or 10 years to think about the ideas and put it down on paper and et cetera. But just two months after dad was killed, mother created this institution with friends and family uh, and had a vision for what it would be a living memorial. Mother went to every United States Senator and many of the Congress persons to lobby for a King holiday so that that could happen. Mother, you know, actually with a coalition built the King Center um, and and the list goes on and on. So, you know, I can't say enough about the, the leadership of women and, and even throughout our movement, although when you think about it, uh, the March on Washington, you know, I think Mahalia Jackson saying uh, Dorothy Height was, Dr. Height was so important, but they didn't allow her to speak. So it was actually, unfortunately, a little bit of a chauvinistic movement. I'm not saying dad made that decision, but I'm not sure that he bucked the decision either. So well, it was the way of the times. I mean. and, and, and so I'm, my only point is, if it had not been for these gigantic women, much of this would not have happened. They were organizing, mobilizing. They were on the phones. They were doing all kinds of things. I mean, you know, when you look at the movement and, and, and Septa McClark and and, 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 the, and the list goes on and on of those who, you know, even Dr. Angelou worked with dad at SCLC. So you had a number of, of very, very important women um, who really were the backbone of the whole movement. So let me transition a little bit because um, what I found is a lot of my success has been because I've had a stable strong, extraordinary partner in my wife, Andrea. And I could not have done, we've been married now 15 years. We've dated longer than that, but married for 15 years. And I can't imagine that I could have gone through a lot of the challenges that I went through without having someone right beside me uh, helping to navigate, even today. Um, some of the mistakes I probably made I know she advised me to do something differently, but you know, we as men, we're we're stubborn and, and sometimes we <laughs> just don't want, we don't do it right. Hey, at least but the thought I, is in your head. <laughs> in my head. So at least I, know later. This, I know this. <laughs> and then I think about the fact of our daughter um, and what she represents today is nothing short. Certainly, yes, she's a manifestation of her grandparents on, on my side as well as my wife's side. But she also is a manifestation of, of you know, the, what my wife instills in her on a daily basis uh, to make her a young, strong, independent woman. Yolanda uh, Renee, 12 years old, says, yes, I want to follow in my grandfather's footsteps, but I want to make my own steps. That has nothing to do. I mean, that's not it. I mean, you, you can't some things you can't. Um, manufacture. This, this is who she is, but it's who she is because of how her mother has raised her and how, you know, she says a lot of things that at 12 years old, I didn't know, but I didn't realize, you know, you, as a parent, you learn that your child is a, many times they are sponges. Everything that I say and do, she is looking at and she takes what I say and converts it to her own verbiage um, and it sounds like, gosh, how did this little 12 year old come up with such a profound concept? So, you know, you must, you have to realize that your children are looking at you, everything you do. And so I always try to conduct myself in such a way that, you know, Yolanda would be proud of, 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 of me. And, um, you know, I'm just, my, Andre and I are so proud of her uh, at, at 12 years old. And I think, you know, the best obviously is, is, is yet to come. So I'm so thankful to have these extraordinarily strong women. I mean, one of the thing that gets on my nerves sometimes, I think I, when I say gets on my nerves, that's not the right way of characterizing. But Yolanda quickly will correct me, particularly if I say <laughs> something that is not 
sensitive to women. If I say something insensitive to women, dad, that, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, you, didn't you just get here? <laughs> but she's right. There's nothing I can say. Oops, that was, that was a mistake. I mean, I, I have countless numbers of examples where Yolanda has God known me. And I'm, I'm like, my God, this is, you know, I've got a little person correcting me. Hey, she just got here, but she's paying Correct. attention. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, uh, last thing, I, I, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but there's a quote from your dad that, that I really love that says something like, uh, in the end, I, I won't be um, as upset about the words of my enemies as about the, the silence of uh, friends. my friends. And uh, I just want to know what you think your dad would think about the allies today. We are seeing since really since the death of George Floyd, it looks different to me. Um, you know, I, I remember looking at some of the protests and having a hard time finding a black person in the crowd. <laughs> like this is, We have some allies now. We have some friends. What, what do you think your dad would say about well, what we do? I, I think he would have been tremendously proud. You know, sir, first of all, very saddened, as we all were, about the death of George Floyd, to see a policeman become judge, jury, and executioner all in one. But he would be very proud of the millions of people in every state in our nation demonstrating. Uh, and if you think about the irony of it, you know, 53, four years ago, he was demonstrating with sanitation workers who had a sign that said, I am a man, treat me with dignity and respect. Many of those sanitation workers were being paid a uh, dollar or two. Uh, they were on welfare and they were working every day uh, picking up the trash. Uh, they were not treated with respect and not being treated with dignity. 53 years later, blacks and whites and all ethnic groups have signs saying Black Lives Matter. The whole nation and world all of a sudden tuned in. Part of it was because of the pandemic and people could see it on the news and see the tragedy. But when you think about it, there were demonstrations in Europe, there were demonstrations in Australia, there were demonstrations on the African continent. There are different demonstrations in South America and in North America and Canada. So almost the entire world was demonstrating, many of them whites uh, saying Black Lives Matter. Those individuals are not going anywhere. We're going to have to address this issue called race for once and for all. And I believe there's a new consciousness that is ready, that is able that is going to keep fighting with us to make sure that the things that should happen to treat people with dignity and justice and righteousness do happen. Um, that's what this new generation of young people are going to do. So I'm, you know, I'm very excited. And I think my father would be very excited about what is potentially going to happen. Well, we certainly appreciate you for holding it down and keeping the dream alive and, and uh, for helping to create someone who's going to be a part of the next generation as well. I think that's, a, that's an important part of it, too. Yeah. But thank you so much for spending some time with thank us. Thank you. Thank Martin you. Luther King III. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell for all notifications from Radio.com. While you're at it, why don't you check out some of our other great videos?